Hi guys, many Muslims claim that there was a golden age of Islam roughly a thousand years ago when most scientific achievements were made and the ground stone was laid for today's technology and scientific achievements. In my videos, I've already pointed out that it was an Arab golden if age as not only Muslims contributed and that these were developments of existing knowledge. Yes, there were great people who made great contributions to mankind almost a thousand years ago. Yes, the level of development was remarkable. Yes, the researchers following that era based a lot of their work on the findings of the Arab scientists. Yes, the center of development and the height of technological advances was Baghdad were thousands of manuscripts with scientific or analytical contents translated from all sorts of countries, civilizations and languages into Arabic? Yes. Was any groundbreaking or mind-boggling discovery made? No. Was any stupendous application developed? No. That happened later when people like Da Vinci or Galileo, Kepler, Leibniz or Newton started using both their brain cells. But what happened in Baghdad or in, in, in Spain, it was good, solid work, establishing facts and providing accurate descriptions of our natural world. And please don't expect me to shed tears over the fact that Moors were kicked out of Spain by the Spanish. If the Muslims who conquered and invaded Spain were so clever, why did they have to come to Cordoba to use their brains? And really, I'd still love to hear from a Muslim exactly which development or scientific breakthrough enabled any renaissance or industrial revolution. And while, while we're in Spain, and, and this is just to counter another myth, according to Necrometrics, the death toll for the Muslim invasion of Spain, as stated in Alithea, the rationalist manual from 1897, seven million during the Saracen slaughters in Spain. Not that peaceful, I would say, considering there were only 250 or 300 million total on the planet. So in reality, we don't rightly know what happened in Cordoba and what is fabricated. The historian John J. O'Neill, in his book Holy Warriors, Islam and the Demise of the Classical Civilization, even goes so far as to say, the archeological non-appearance of the Islamic Golden Age is surely one of the most remarkable discoveries to come to light in the past century. Because nothing in the form of architecture remains as even the mosque in Cordoba was Visigoth and only converted, not constructed. So what happened to the claimed wealth and Islamic features and influence? Just a myth? Weird. Going back to, he, he also states the the Muslim conquest of Spain produced instead of a golden age of science and learning, a bloodbath and an interminable war of attrition. Further, it was in Spain that the first crusades began. So let's look at some of the claimed contributions during the Arab golden age. So what we have is that, that we have universities, we have distillation, filtration, crystallization, we have pharmacies, we have trigonometry, we have architecture, observatories, and Arab fiction, poetry. We have exquisite works of Islamic art. And the Crusades in the 12th and 13th century and the Mongol invasions of the 13th century and a number of plagues contributed to the weakening of the Islamic world and a gradual ending of the Golden Age. Now this sounds modest, factual and realistic. Did anyone invent anything new? No, not really. I mean, I was able to find only one invention, that of a type of water pump. One invention, not a thousand and one. To contrast this, there's a this, this slick and polished exhibition touring the planet along with a movie, a book and accompanying brochures and educational packages all claiming to show a thousand and one inventions made by Muslims. This is distributed to school children along with instructions to teachers 
on how to make these into fun activities, teaching the kids how stuff works and making them believe all this was invented by Islam and Muslims, following the age-old motto of get them young. The internet page is also pretty slick and obviously designed by professionals and full of marketing tricks. So where do all these claims come from? Should this be called a thousand and one inventions or a thousand and one nights? Can I, or can I manage to put some facts on the table here? We are presented with well, Prince Charles in the form of a photo, implying in the text that he actively supports the exhibition or initiative or whatever you want to call this. In reality, what he's done is write the foreword of one of the editions of the book saying that I am delighted to see the success of the initiative called A Thousand and One Different Inventions, which presents and celebrates the many scientific, technological and humanitarian developments shared by the Islamic world and the West. It's romantic, but hardly earth-shattering. The rest of the page is only self-praise and marketing. We are informed that the book is richly illustrated, something I last saw in Harun Yahya's hilarious Atlas of Creation. We're also told that it is now an award-winning international science and cultural heritage brand. Whatever that may mean. Probably nothing, but it has all the right keywords. Meaningless yet effective. They claim they are the global leader in popularizing awareness of the thousand year golden age of Muslim civilization and then say that men and women of different faiths and cultures built on knowledge from ancient civilizations. So first it's Muslim civilization and then it's men and women of different faiths and cultures. So what happened to Muslim civilization? Not so Muslim anymore. Also found on the page is the announcement that the exhibition will open in Washington. They tell you that, well, it's in the National Geographic Museum. They tell you where it is and what the entrance fees are. But more than a picture with some smiling faces, I would be interested in the exhibition themselves, instead of being lured into something without any knowledge what the contents is. They also advertise a book which was published earlier this year and apparently contains the foreword of Prince Charles. They even provide an ISBN number to facilitate ordering, but this number does not lead to Amazon or any retailer. It doesn't exist. Does the approach via the author, a Salim T.S. Al-Hassani, provide any hints? Well, he's an honorary professorial fellow at the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Manchester. His background is mechanical engineering, so he should know all about water pumps and stuff. Initially, I thought I had drawn another blank as the first 10 or 20 pages only provided links back to the 1001 Inventions webpage. But later, I finally found the book and much cheaper than the £25 normally charged when purchased from a thousand and one inventions themselves. But on top of failing to provide a usable ISBN number, they also failed to provide some help in distinguishing this book from a similar one and what the differences actually are. The one is about the legacy of Muslims, the different one covers their heritage. It's very difficult to tell them apart when you're looking at Google. Now inside the book, I took, well the book I took so long to locate, we find page after page of illustrations and photos. That's why it's so thick. The information is repeated over and over and I learned that the golden age lasted from exactly 632 CE to 1796 CE. Not quite a thousand years but almost. But how is the beginning of the golden age of scientific development marked? Well, easy, the death of Muhammad. How does that relate to scientific development or achievement? Pfft, nobody knows. It probably sounded like a good idea to someone. The last entry, well, it seems to be the opening of a hospital in 1154, so I'll never know what event actually marked the end of the Golden Age in 1796. But it explains why they claim the Golden Age lasted like a thousand years. And I somehow, I managed to come up with only half of that, 500 years. Odd. At the end of the book, there are pages and pages of names, but no list of the 1001 inventions. 
Now, before I go and take a look at some of the claims and show how the marketing trick works, I want to find out how this endeavor, which must be immensely cost intensive, is funded. Now, initially in 2006, it was paid for by the UK government. Hmm. The launching institution was, and still is, the FSTC, the Foundation for Science, Technology and Civilization. Its aim is to increase knowledge on Muslim heritage, as it is totally and completely non-religious and apolitical. They also want to promote Muslim heritage, totally non-religious, of course. It is probably sheer coincidence that the president of FSTC and the author of the book mentioned earlier are both Salim T.S. al-Hassani. Well, they can't make up their minds, but the deputy chairman or, or chairman, they swap between the two, who is also a professor, a Mohammed al-Gumati, obtained his single BSc in two areas, maths and physics. Now, this does not mean that generally the academic titles are the result of diploma mills and worthless, just that I personally have my reservations. It is written on the FSTC page that Professor El Gomati is a prolific scientist who publishes extensively, and they provide a link to his latest 30 publications. Um, alas, these are dated all the way back to 2000, and many are just proceedings or talks, not as prolific or active as I would have expected. What I suspect is closer to the truth is the following statement that he's a religious advisor to a number of UK universities and charities and speaks on the contribution of Muslims in science, technology and civilization. Now that fits much better with what the aims are. But back to the funding. It says there that the global tour of the 1001 Inventions exhibition is sponsored by ALG Community Initiatives, which is the corporate social responsibility arm of the ALG Group, a Toyota automobiles distributor in 13 different countries. Yes, I could not find out who pays for the materials, exhibits, documentation and the pricey marketing in form of a movie including the actor Ben Kingsley. Besides. The FSTC, which wants to trigger a social change by exploring the cultural roots of science, I found groups such as the Muslim Heritage and the Muslim Heritage Awareness Group and the Curriculum Enrichment for the Future, as well as various names which are dropped to make it look as though institutions such as Wellcome Trust and the British Science Association are part of the initiative. Who at the end of the day the investors are is not actually revealed. There is no business plan and no strategy paper. There are indirect indicators where a Saudi ambassador presents a book financed in the UAE. This seems to be quite, quite intricate. The list of references and further resources is endless and probably lists every book with Muslim and science in the title. It even lists Arabic atheists, something I was surprised to see and I admit I feel respect for the organizers here that they don't sweep these people under the rug, which normally happens. But then Jim Khalili only talks about science in general and even says the pinhole camera was invented by Ibn al-Haytham or al-Hazen as he was also known. That's how good this propaganda machinery works. Associate advancements and, and research into optics to a person and attribute a minor but well-known invention to that person and people will believe it. Repeat often and everybody accepts it as a fact. And this is how the marketing trick works. Find an established and proven fact which establishes a person as being reputable. Link an invention to that person as a sort of a quick win. Now you don't have to go to details any longer and can make unobtrusive claims without anyone questioning them. If you read the text provided by 1001 Inventions, you will find that they suddenly use a lot of it is thought that, it is likely that, what probably can be or linked with, may have happened, etc, etc. After a while you will see sentences saying that in those days people 
unlike many today, had expressed their religious commitment and faith through deeds useful to society, thereby eroding the principle of non-religiosity and inserting religious dogma into the educational material. Sentences such as this one, linking aspects of our modern lives that are linked with inventions by Muslims or were inspired by Islam. How is that objective in any way? This is just another way of introducing religion into the classroom and via the back door under the guise of education and non-religious objective information. While in reality, it is cheap as propaganda. And also what they do is they provide a disclaimer showing that if there's anything wrong, it's my fault, not theirs. We are the ones who are criticizing and therefore are automatically wrong. So we have claims which are not really formulated. The website just plants teasers and of, of things that will be shown without ever showing them. We are fed sound bites and empty phrases such as inventors created marvels or scientific breakthrough while never establishing the real origin of an invention and its modern descendant. Let me, let me make an example. The, the great Ibn al-Haytham, the, the polymath who lived from 965 to 1040 CE, contributed a great deal in physics, mathematics, mainly optics, and all the way to the scientific method. He based his work on existing knowledge provided by the Greeks, Indians, Chinese, and the Egyptians, and researched further, disproving, for example, the ancient Greek idea that light comes out of the, the eye, bounces off objects, and comes back to the eye. But are all applications and products involving light and glass now based on Alhatham's research? No, of course not. And he did not determine the speed of light either, as is claimed by some Muslims. A question that comes to mind here, shouldn't a professor or even two professors know the difference between an invention and a discovery? Did Alhatham really invent the pinhole camera? No. He provided different advancements, especially when solving problems where he had to expand on existing mathematics in order to solve and demonstrate a particular problem, explaining and demonstrating the principles. But the pinhole camera itself, or camera obscura, it's been around for well over 2000 years. Morzi or Morti, a Chinese philosopher, referred to this device as locked treasure room. Aristotle, Euclid, Theon, Antemius, etc. They all knew about, described and experimented with pinhole cameras. So there's no need to have it reinvented by Alhatham. So this approach of taking a well-known principle or object and then artificially linking it emotionally with a particular Muslim is the way this entire scheme works. It deceives naive and trusting people and those who are easily impressed. Children. It is only when a claim is researched that the flaws come through and the highly polished surface suddenly cracks wide open and the truth comes through. Like the coffee claim. Coffee was first brewed in Yemen around the 9th century, brought to Cairo by a group of students. And this means coffee was invented by the Arabs. Well, no, sorry, by the Muslims. Can any of this be verified? No, not really. There are so many legends and claims due to the popularity of the drink, the favorite hot beverage anywhere. We, we think the first bush was identified as coffee in Ethiopia. But then again, we had coffee bushes in the garden and that was in East Africa. So where it was discovered and by whom is impossible to ascertain. But we know that the neighbors from Yemen were the first to trade the beans and this gradually started off the craving for drinks containing caffeine. The same goes for claims surrounding perfumes or fabrics. And no, sorry to have to say this, the zero was not invented by Muslims, but has existed for something like, what, 5,000 years and was actively used, i.e. not as placeholder by the Indians until it was rediscovered by Italian mathematician Fibonacci and has proved to be quite useful. No, we don't really use Arabic numerals either, but a mixture of different influences. So anyone who actually knows Arabic numerals will appreciate this. And the claim that involves a human flying in a glider, yeah, it's just as far-fetched and is based only on wishful thinking. 
We have claims of people attaching themselves to kites and balloons. We have powered flights made two and a half thousand years ago, all with a maybe or possibly attached to it, or the some say introduction. Al Hassani from the 1001 Inventions does not provide any kind of conditional form. He seriously claims that Abbas in Firnas, the first man to fly, who launched his flying machine over the Spanish city of Cordoba more than a thousand years before the Wright brothers took to the sky. He doesn't mention that he was supposedly 65 years old and that this is sourced by the historian Lynn Townsend White to an account in the 17th century. Hardly credible. Hearsay and a fable. But this does not stop a man calling himself a professor misleading people by making it look as though there is evidence to support this claim. And as though putting a beard and a turban on a model hang glider pilot makes it true. And to top it all off, he calls it a replica of what? His imagination? The other itemized claims are also mostly hearsay and maybes. I mean, things like water clocks have been around for thousands of years, so there's no biggie here. Why make it look so? Just to be clear on this, I'm not talking about whether or not someone built a hospital or university with some unique feature, which I showed in the beginning. That's laudable and great. I'm talking about the rubbish claims. The first camera, the first pump, the first glider, the first surgery, first astronomical whatever. But what bothers me most is that this company, trying to establish itself as a brand, which is recognized and perceived as reliable, is not caught out from the word go. It seems that anything starting with an A will be claimed by Islamic institutions in the future. And what bothers me about this is that anyone can make any claim made by these people and verify it, or, or falsify it, in the cases that I looked at. But why are people so gullible and uncritical? Every adult, and especially parents of young children, should know by now about viruses being sent by email looking perfectly credible. Everybody should know that a letter telling you of a huge amount of cash just waiting to be picked up by you is a scam. Anything that sounds too good to be true probably is. And this also goes for scientific claims or claims made to sound scientific using pseudoscience. Are we too lax in checking scientists because we're too lazy or afraid that we might look inferior? Don't we care what our children are taught? Don't we first check? I mean, scientists such as humans and fallible, so why don't people check just a little bit? We all know the hype which surrounded Zakir Naik and Harun Yahya and how foolish they look today because they lied and fed people false information. And this was unearthed by the internet and people with critical thinking skills. Will the same be true of a thousand and one inventions when people start looking behind the sparkling facade and realize that none of the claims can be verified the way they were made? These are not facts. These are elements or nuggets of truth which are drawn out and blown up out of all proportions. Yes, the research during the Arab Golden Age contributed towards later discoveries. Yes, I will admit that easily and any time. But then, doesn't all research do this? Why not simply stick to the truth? Muslim scholars brought many new inventions and also improved or reintroduced old inventions, like the elephant clock, which embraced many cultures as a scientific dedication of respect and understanding. The seven meters high clock uses Greek water raising technology, an Indian elephant, an Egyptian phoenix, Arabian figures, Persian carpet, and a Chinese dragon to celebrate the diversity of the world. Now that, that is what it boils down to. Just a mix of people doing their thing, each contributing in their own capacity and ability. There's no need to make any group of people, whether it be based on race, gender, ethnicity or belief, look better or worse than they are. And thank you for your time. Ah, yeah. Oh, please go and check out the other, how many, 998 claims they make and prove they are fallacious claims just deception, misrepresentation, lies and or trickery.
don't allow them to get away with this trickery. Thank you.